Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our study. Almighty God, we acknowledge that your word is your revealed and authoritative word. Therefore, we submit under the authority of your word today. Dear Jesus, God the Son, we believe that the word is your mind. It is the mind of Christ. And we desperately want to know the mind of Christ today. And God the Holy Spirit, we believe that you have inspired the word. You are the one who reveals the word and illuminates the word in our minds so that we can understand the mind of Christ, so that we can joyfully and humbly submit to the word of God. So Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we humbly lift this study up to you. May you be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles, please. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2 as we continue our study through the epistles. And uh, today we are going to focus specifically on verses 17 through 21. But we'll do a little, a little bit of a review. Uh, as you can see on the screen behind me, the sermon, uh, the message is entitled, uh, Peter's Cowardice and Paul's Courage, Part 3. And so we're going to do a minor review of Parts 1 and 2 to get you up to speed. And then we're going to dig into Part 3. All right, your attention please. Everybody watch me here, a little, little background here. Remember I taught you about a really important place? It's called Syrian Antioch. Syrian Antioch was north of Jerusalem, and this was a place where a lot of firsts happened. This was really the first place where Gentiles were evangelized, and that both Jewish believers and Gentile believers communed together in the church of Christ. It was also the first place where followers of Christ were actually called Christians. There in Antioch. It was there in Antioch that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were co pastoring there, preaching the gospel, teaching the word of Christ. And it's also from Antioch that the first missionary journey occurred where Paul and Barnabas were set apart by the Holy Spirit and the leaders there in Antioch and they went on their first missionary journey to guess where? We're reading the, the, the letter now. To the region of Galatia. And remember we told you, we, we learned about the, 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 the Galatians were a mixed breed of people. Uh, primarily, they, they, they found their origins in what is today known as France, but they were the Gauls who migrated down there. They were the people of Gaul, the Galatians, okay? And they were a pagan group, okay? And Paul and Barnabas went there, preached the gospel. People are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. God in his grace started saving souls. First in Sidon, Antioch, not to be confused with Syrian Antioch. Also Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. So they planted churches there. They strengthened the believers there. Then they returned back to Syrian Antioch and did ministry there. Well, what ended up happening was a bunch of false teachers called the Judaizers decided they were going to make their way to Galatia and they tried to poison the minds of the young believers there, saying that Paul was not a true apostle, saying that Paul did not preach the true gospel. They even made up stories about Paul saying he got in an argument with the apostles down there. They, they made up the fact that they said, well, they were sent specifically under the authority of James, who was one of the pillars of the Jerusalem church, which James had never sent them. They were there to cause chaos and problems. Well, 
they also ended up going to Antioch and trying to cause problems there. Well, when Paul, Paul and Barnabas heard this, they got upset. And that led to a big meeting down in Jerusalem called the Jerusalem Council, Acts chapter 15, where the Judaizers showed up, Paul and Barnabas from Antioch showed up, you had Peter, James, uh, uh, the elders of the church down in Jerusalem. They had this big meeting to try to figure out, okay, how are Gentiles truly saved? They knew how the Jews were saved because when Peter preached the gospel on the day of Pentecost, he preached the gospel of grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone. Boom, 3,000 people trusted Christ. Most of them were Jews. And the, Jew, the first Christian church, you know this, don't you? was primarily Jewish people. It started in Jerusalem. And so the question wasn't like it is today. Many people ask, well, how were Jewish people saved? <laughs> Back then the question was, how were Gentiles saved? And so this big meeting was to decide how Gentiles are saved. The Judaizers said, no, Gentiles can only be saved if they're first circumcised according to the customs of, the, uh, uh, of Moses, the laws of Moses. Uh, um, they have to follow the traditions of Moses. They have to become Jews. And then they can believe in Jesus. And then they can be saved. In other words, they were preaching a Jesus plus gospel. They were preaching salvation is by works. Well, Paul and Barnabas and Peter and James, they said, no, no, no. Salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone. Gentiles do not need to be circumcised, do not be, need to become Jews. They do need, not need to follow, you know, uh, slavishly all the traditions of, of the Jews. No, no, no. Well, the Jewish council came up with their verdict. The Judaizers were wrong. Paul and his gospel was correct. That's because Paul got his gospel from Jesus. And it's interesting how Peter and James you know, down there in Jerusalem, agreed with Paul's gospel. Why? Because they all got the same gospel from the same source, Jesus. Well, letters were then sent out with the decision that happened at Jerusalem Council. Letters went up to Antioch. Letters went out to Galatia. Everybody was happy. Paul and Barnabas returned back to Antioch. And uh, Peter decides he's going to make a visit up there. Going to hang out a little bit. And again, this was a very unique church up there. It was mixed of Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Kind of like here, we've got Macedonian believers, Croatian believers, Romy believers, international, European believers. So we've got a hodgepodge of people here, right? Which is actually, I think, a picture of what it's going to be like in heaven, right? Revelation chapter 7. People from every tribe, every nation, every tongue worshiping Jesus. Well, Peter ends up going up there. He's having a good time, hanging out with the Jewish believers, the Gentile believers, eating with them, celebrating the Lord's Supper with them, worshiping the Lord in the church there. And then something happened. The Judaizers made their way up there. And Peter got wind that they were coming. And let's see what ended up happening here. What we're going to do is we're going to break it down, this section here, into three Ds. Number one, we're going to see Paul's dilemma that he had to deal with. Number two, we're going to see Paul's doctrine. And both the dilemma and doctrine are review. And then number three, we're going to see Paul's defense. And that's where we're really going to dig in today, something new. Okay? So, number one, let's look at Paul's dilemma, verses 11 through 14. When Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is another name for Peter, Paul says, I oppose him to his face. Why, Paul? Because he, Peter, stood condemned. Peter condemned himself. Well, what happened? For before certain men came from James, see, the Judaizers were claiming again that they were sent by James from Jerusalem. James clearly in Acts 15 denied that. When certain men came from James, he, Peter, used to eat with the Gentiles. That was his regular practice. But when they, the Judaizers, arrived, he, Peter, began to draw back and separate himself like a military deserter. It was gradual. It was decept deceptive. And he separated himself from the Gentiles. Why? Because he was afraid to lose his popularity. He was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. 
The other Jews joined Peter in his hypocrisy. The other young Jewish believers up there in Antioch. So that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, the co-pastor, was led astray. Up on the screen, we learned this Greek word. Paul was upset. This was a major dilemma. An esteemed apostle, Peter, shows himself to be a hypocrite. A bunch of the young Jewish believers start following Peter's hypocrisy. To the point that even Paul's buddy and co-pastor, Barnabas, starts acting like a hypocrite in front of the Judaizers. Oh, we don't hang out with the Gentiles. Hypocrisy. And that's why in verse 14, Paul said, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew. Yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. You've been hanging out with the Gentiles. How is it then, Peter, that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? It's not like Peter was standing up and preaching a false gospel. It's not like Peter was standing up and saying, hey, come on, Jews, follow me. It was Peter's actions. And you have to understand something. In ministry, as a leader, people are watching you every step of the way. And sometimes you don't have to say a word in order to get people to follow your ways. The question is, are they going to follow you as you're following the truth of the gospel? Or are they going to follow you into hypocrisy? Yeah, yeah, you, you got to see what Jesus has to say about that word, hypocritus. Keep your finger there. Let's go real quick. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, the hypocritus chapter. By the way, Jesus is talking about religious people here. Was Peter pretty religious? Was Barnabas religious? Were the Jewish believers religious? Yeah. Where's, where's hypocrisy happen most? Yeah. In the church. <laughs> and so look what Jesus says in chapter 6, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, he's talking about people who are good people, who want to help others. Do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. Why? To be honored by others. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you do give to the need, notice he doesn't say if, he says when you do. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't even be a hypocrite by yourself and start congratulating yourself how great you are. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. But it's not really in secret because your father, who sees what is done in secret, he'll reward you. Let him say well done to you. Let's look at another thing on hypocrisy. Verse 5, how about prayer? Again, you see religious people, right? And when you pray, not if you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. Why? To be seen by others. Jesus says, truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, you go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret, let him reward you. Now that doesn't mean you can't pray in front of others. We just now, before we start a study, we pray together. But can you imagine like I'm up here praying and I'm acting like I'm a godly pastor and I'm sitting here and all of a sudden I kind of in my prayer go, oh Lord, we want you to be honored and glorified. I just kind of open my eye. I'm like, is anybody watching me? <laughs> how, how, how do I look on the camera? <laughs> Hypocrites. Let's look at another one. Look at verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. Why? They disfigure their faces to show they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, you've received, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, look normal, so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In other words, if you're going to fast, 
you know, and you're invited like to a small group. Like tonight, we have a couples group, right? And you know, you're, we got all this food out there. They're passing the field. No, I'm fasting. <laughs> and, then, and then all of a sudden, right, we're eating and eating, and you're sitting there going, you're just starting to make faces and suffering because you want all of us to feel guilty because you're fasting, you hypocrite. Jesus sums it up in verse 1 of chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Your motivation is not to please man, hypocrite. Your motivation is to please God. If you do, act like a hypocrite, you're not going to have a reward from your Father in heaven. Back to Galatians. Do you see what Peter was doing? He was worried what the people thought about him. Hypocrites. That was Paul's dilemma. You imagine? I mean, I act like a hypocrite. I'm your pastor. What do you do with that? That's a dilemma you're facing, right? Because you see it. You know what's right. What did, he, what did Paul do? He opposed them. Especially when it's outward hypocrisy. Outward hypocrisy deserves outward condemnation so that others don't follow it so we saw paul's dilemma now we look here in verses 15 through 16 paul goes through his doctrine he says hey peter verse 15 we who are jews by birth and not sinful gentiles we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ. So we too, Peter, have put our faith in Christ Jesus. Why? That we may be justified, how? By faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Why? Peter, you know this. You've preached this. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified you see how many times in paul's doctrine the word justified is used everybody wants to be justified in god's eyes what's justified mean meaning being declared by god not guilty in his eyes and also being declared by god righteous in his sight okay it's a legal act okay god declares you not guilty in his sight and also righteous in his sight now here's the question Everybody, I would say, wants to be justified in God's sight. I would say the vast majority of humanity, right? Well, the question is how? Well, there's really only two ways. It's either by the works of the law, law meaning namas, or it's by faith in Christ, pistis. That's it. And you think about it, Every other religion in the world, they are seeking to be justified. How? Right there. Works of the law. Whether it's trying to follow God's law as revealed in his scripture, or whether it's trying to follow their own laws they've made up for their religion. Don't eat, don't touch, don't this, don't do, 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 do. you have to do this, you have to do that, da, da, da. right? The only religion that says you are justified by faith alone in Christ alone is Christianity. Why? Well, it's real simple. Look what Paul says in chapter 3 about the law. Verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law to try to be saved, you're under a what? A curse. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything in the book of the law. It's impossible. Clearly, Paul says, no one who relies on the law is what? Justified before God. Why? Because the righteous will live how? By faith. By the way, that's a quote from the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. How were people in the Old Testament saved? By faith. 
pistis. Paul says in verse 12, the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us, Paul says, from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us in our place. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He, Christ, redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, along with the Jews, through Christ Jesus. So that by faith, we receive the promise of the Spirit. Is that clear right there? Okay, that's Paul's doctrine. Peter knew that doctrine, but Peter got confused because Peter allowed himself to get caught up worrying about what other people thought. He became a hypocrite. And his hypocrisy misled other people. Paul says, no, 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 no. So here's the question then. Sounds like Paul is an antinomist. What's an antinomist? Against the law. That's what it sounds like, right? No. Do you guys understand what the purpose of the law was? Keep your finger here. Go to Romans chapter 3. And then we'll get into our new stuff. Look at Romans chapter 3. Verses 20 through 26. Look what scripture says. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Why? Because through the law, we become conscious of what? Sin. Watch me. God's word is not simply meant to comfort you. It is meant to discomfort you. God's word is to point you to the sad truth about us. We all have a sin nature. None of us chooses God or wants God. And none of us can be saved through our own efforts. How do I know that? Look at you, stay right there in chapter 3. Look at verses 10 through 12. As it's written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So what's the purpose of the law? If we can't reach its standards, what's the purpose of it? To point us to our need for a savior. You've got to understand the bad news. How do you understand the bad news? When you understand God's law. And you go, oops, I can't come close to keeping it. Then how am I going to be justified? If I can't be justified by the works of the law, <gasps> I can be justified by faith in Christ. Exactly. That's why Paul goes on to say, verse 21, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made, to which the Old Testament law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given how? Through faith. In whom? In Jesus Christ. To all who believe, not to all who work for it. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified how? What's the F word? <laughs> this is a good F word. Freely. By his grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Atonement means propitiation. It means that God the Father raised up a substitute, his beloved son, who was sent to this earth on a mission to justify wicked people like us. Unlike us, Jesus was born without a sin nature, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Unlike us, Jesus, who is God, who became man, the perfect God-man, lived a perfect life. He perfectly fulfilled the law in our place. God didn't abolish the law in our lives. We still have to fulfill it. Problem is we can't. So somebody had to fulfill it in our place. Who's that? God who became man. And then 
Christ allowed himself to go to that cross. Why? To be punished in our place because we're the lawbreakers. Do you understand? The law had to be fulfilled. We can't do it. Christ did it for us. Our law breaking had to be punished. We couldn't pay for it. Who did it? Christ. And as he hung there, God the Father and his love for us took our sins, placed them on Jesus, and punished Jesus in our place as our substitute. Jesus died. But what happened three days later? He rose from the dead. By rising from the dead, he paid for our sins in full in terms of the day of judgment. By rising from the dead, God the Father declared, I accept that sacrifice for you, Esther, for you, David. Do you see? And as a result, once we trust in Jesus Christ, not in our own efforts, but we trust in Christ by faith. Our sins are forgiven in terms of that day of judgment. We are declared justified in God's sight. Not guilty in God's sight because Christ paid for our guilt. We are declared righteous in God's sight because God sees the righteousness of Christ covering us. The righteousness of Christ, His righteousness has been credited to our account. And this all happened, verse 25, because God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And it's to be received by faith, trusting in him. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He could have sent so many people to hell but he did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Back to Galatians. Does that make sense? So it's here in chapter two we see Paul's dilemma dealing with Peter who made some hypocritical mistakes. We then see Paul's doctrine He's saying, Peter, you know this stuff. You know this, Peter. You heard Christ declare it. Peter, you even declared it at Pentecost. Peter, you were there at the Jerusalem Council. Peter, you know this stuff. What's wrong with you, Peter? Does that make sense? So we see the dilemma, we see the doctrine, and now we're going to see Paul's airtight defense that really locks Peter down, okay, to bring him back to reality, okay? Starting in verse 17, he said, hey, Peter, if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves among the sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes what? Sin. You guys know what he's talking about there? No. <laughs> There's several different uh, views on this. I'll give you the right one. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me, let me give you the background here. Keep your finger. Let's do a little surfing, okay? Let's go to Mark chapter seven. It's a quick review. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? Obviously, Peter was there. Mark chapter seven. Look at verse 18. He says to his disciples, are you so dull? This is after he had given a parable. He says, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can do what? Defile them. For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of their body. And then look what Mark said. In saying this, Jesus declared what? All foods clean. Meaning that Jews didn't have to have their special foods. Their, 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 their foods that were separated from the Gentiles. You see that? Peter was there. Peter heard that. Who, who made this statement? Jesus, Jesus said this, right? Which was totally contrary to what the Judaizers were saying, right? Go to Acts chapter 10 real quick. Okay. Verses 11 through 15 remember we learned this a couple weeks ago peter was up on the roof he was having a vision uh, he was hungry he fell into a trance he had a vision verse 11 he saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being let down to the earth by its four corners it contained all kinds of four-footed animals 
as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord Peter replied. I've never eaten anything, what? Impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made, what? Clean. Back to Galatians, I'll explain to you. So, remember, Paul has his dilemma with who here? Peter. Paul is reminding Peter of the doctrine. And now Paul is going to give an airtight defense. To who? Peter. So he says, hey, Peter. If we, you, Peter, me, are justified how? Pistis, by faith, and not by the works of the law, like the Judaizers are saying you have to be. Well, Peter, let me ask you a question. Remember when Jesus said to you that all foods are clean? Remember the vision from heaven? The Lord said to you, all people are clean. Obviously, when he was talking about animals, he was using the, the reference. It was about peoples, Jews and Gentiles. Because we know that that was sending, after that vision, Peter was sent to the Gentile home of Cornelius. So Peter, do you remember when the Lord said to you, this was the words of the Lord. All food is clean, all people are clean. That's why, Peter, you can eat with Gentiles. But Peter, the Judaizers are saying, that's wrong. Peter, can I ask you a question? Is Christ, because he taught you that, the sinner? <laughs> what do you think Peter's response was? <laughs> Same as Paul's. Look what he said. Absolutely not. Do you see his defense? Peter, if your buddies, the Judaizers, are right, then I guess, Peter, you and I are wrong because we trusted in Christ alone, through faith alone, His grace alone. It's okay to eat with Gentiles. It's okay to hang out with Gentiles because the Lord told us it's okay. Well, if your Judaizer buddies are right, Peter, let me ask you a question. Does that mean Christ is a sinner for teaching us that? Oh, my. It's like all of a sudden, a person from a different religion comes in here and starts saying to you that everything that I'm teaching you is wrong. Well, what am I teaching you? From what? The word of God. So if I'm wrong, oh my goodness, that means God is wrong? If I'm teaching you something that's wrong and sinful and I'm getting it from here, that must mean that, oh my goodness, God's a sinner. Absolutely not. By the way, this is a good thing when people try to argue with you with Scripture. They disagree with your beliefs and this and that. I'm just showing you what it says here. If you have a problem, your problem's with God. Excuse me, you're calling God a liar? Do you see what Paul was saying to Peter? You imagine Peter's just hypocrisy starting to go down a little bit, right? Paul says in verse 18, he goes, no, no, no. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then really, I'm the lawbreaker. What does he mean there? Keep your finger there. Go to Philippians real quick. Chapter 3. What does he mean if he rebuilds what he destroyed? Well, let's look who Paul was before he was the apostle Paul. He was Saul. Philippians chapter 3. Look what he says. Verse 4, if anyone has, he goes, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in their flesh, in other words, to earn their salvation, he goes, I have more confidence. I was circumcised on the eighth day. He says, I was of the people of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the what? 
law faultless. He was great at trying to earn his salvation according to the namas. Right? He was the best. He had built his religious life around that. Well, what ended up happening? Again, we go on. That came crashing down. Why? Look at verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, those things he thought were good, I now consider them loss. Why? For the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything, his old way of living, his religious ways, a loss. He says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus. That righteousness that comes from God on the basis of what? Faith. Go back. Do you see what Paul's saying? He said, hey, Peter, number one, if your guys are right and we're wrong, we heard it straight from Christ, then that means Christ is a lawbreaker? Absolutely not, Paul. Peter. Peter, let me tell you something. If we, you and me, go back now to what these Judaizers are saying, if we rebuild that wrong system for salvation, remember that system, Peter, who I used to be? I was the best trying to earn my justification and righteousness based on the works of the law. But Peter, when Christ saved me on that day to Damascus, Peter, when Christ saved you, that all came crashing down, that false stuff. Peter, if we try to now rebuild that based upon what the Judaizers are saying, Peter, we're the sinners. We're the sinners. Oops, <laughs> sorry. I'm the lawbreaker. I'm the lawbreaker, Peter, and so are you. And it's the same thing for you. If all of a sudden you have the word of truth and you, you understand salvation, your old system of how you thought you were going to be accepted by God came crashing down. Are you going to try to now rebuild that false system back up? Because other people are telling you that you're wrong? Well, actually, if they're telling you you're wrong, they're saying Christ is wrong because you got it from Christ. And now you're going to go back and try to build up that false system? Guess what? If anybody's wrong, you're wrong. That's what Paul is saying to Peter. You think Peter's hypocrisy is starting to go down a little bit? Look what he goes on to say in verse 19. He says, hey, Peter... For through the law, I what? Died. Underline that. I died to the law. Why? So that I might live for God. Wait a second. How do you die to the law? Well, keep your finger there. By the way, we're going to now go back and forth. Galatians, Romans. Just keep your finger there. Go to Romans. Now I'm going to give you some good doctrine here. Romans chapter 7. Starting in verse 1. Look at this. Don't you know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law, he's talking now about marriage law here, by the way, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person, what? Lives. He gives an example. For example, by law, a married woman, let's say Esther, is bound to her husband, Dragon, as long as he is alive. But if her husband Dragon dies, she is released from that law of marriage that binds her to him. Esther, you cannot kill him. All right? So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while Dragon is still alive, she's called a what? Adulteress. But if Dragon dies, She's released from that law. She's not an adulteress if she marries another man. Do you understand the illustration? And now watch what Paul says. 
So my brothers and sisters, verse 4, you also die to the law, how? Through the body of Christ. In other words, Christ fulfilled the law for you. And through Christ's death and resurrection, he paid for your lawlessness. You died to this old system. Are you still under the system? No, you died to it. He says, I died to the law as a way for salvation. Look what he says. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, watch, trying to be saved through the law, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for what? Death. But now by dying to once to what once bound us, we have been released from the law in trying to earn our salvation to it. doesn't mean we don't follow it and try to obey God, but in terms of trying to be saved. Esther, are you under the law of marriage to Dragon right now? Because he's alive. But guess what? If he dies, you're released from that law of marriage. You're free. Yes. <laughs> in like manner, guess what? Christ fulfilled the law for you. Christ died for your lawlessness. Guess what? You died to the law as a way of salvation. You are now free and belong to another. His name is Christ. Verse 6, by dying to, one, to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we might serve in the new way of the what? The spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So Paul says, hey, Peter, don't you remember your buddies, the Judaizers, are telling you, la, 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 Peter, we died to the law. We're released from that. We're released from all the Jewish restrictions. We're released from all the Jewish traditions. Doesn't mean we don't respect them, but we don't try to follow them to earn our salvation. Does that make sense? You go to church, why, Christian? To earn your salvation? No. Many of you used to think that, but you died to that. Now you live for Christ. It'll come together. Go to verse 19 and 20. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. How did you die to the law, Christian? Look at verse 20. I have been what? Crucified with Christ. What in the world does that mean? Go back to Romans chapter Six. So Paul says he died to the law. Look what else he says up here. He was crucified with Christ. How do you die to the law? You got to be crucified. But how do you crucify with Christ? Watch this. Look at verse three, chapter six. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his what? Death. Watch me. When you trusted Christ Jesus, watch me here. The day you were saved, you were baptized into Christ. You were baptized into his death you were baptized into his resurrection. You are in Christ. Look at verse three. Don't you know that all of us, talking to Christians, who were baptized into Christ Jesus, meaning into a relationship with him, you were baptized into his death. You were crucified with Christ. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too 
may live a new life. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, meaning we were crucified with him, we died with him, we rose with him, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Guess what? Glorified body and soul. For we know that our old self was what? Crucified with him. So that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Not that we're not going to sin, but we will no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died with Christ has been set free from the enslavement of sin. So watch, Paul says to Peter, Peter, your buddies, the Judaizers, if they're saying you're wrong, guess what? They're saying Christ is wrong. Is Christ a sinner, Peter? No. Hey, Peter, if you and I go back and rebuild that which we tore down, our false way of thinking we could earn our salvation, we rebuild that, we're sinners. By the way, Peter, we're not going to go back to that old way. You know why? Because we died to the law. How did we die to the law? We were crucified with Christ. How? We were baptized into Christ so that we were on the cross with Christ. We died with Christ. We were raised to a new life with Christ. Why? Because we are in Christ. So, the law that he fulfilled in our place, God looks as, at us as though we fulfilled it. The penalty for our sins that was paid for, God looks as like we don't have any sin in terms of that day of judgment. We died to the law. Guess what? Because Christ fulfilled the law for us, paid for our lawlessness, guess what? That old marriage partner we used to have died. Guess what? We're free to marry someone else. Oh, who are we married to now? Christ. So why would we go back to the old way? The old way is dead. In fact, he goes on to say in Galatians, Verse 19, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Watch me, watch me, watch me. You were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. So, Everything that Christ did at that cross, it's as though you did with him. Make sense? Not only that, now Christ lives in you through his spirit. Because Paul was probably thinking the Judaizers are going to say, oh, you died to the law, you've been crucified with Christ. Great, now you can go do anything you want. No. Christ lives in you. It's not you that's living simply. It's Christ living in you. Is Christ going to lead you to sin? Is, the, is Christ going to lead you to disobey the word? No. Look here in Romans 6. Verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin under the power and penalty of sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin, Christian, reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer your, your, any part of yourself, Christian, to sin as an instrument to wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from what to what? Death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Why? Verse 14. For sin shall no longer be your what? Master. Because you are not under the law. You're under what? Grace. Back 
to Galatians. Paul makes his defense after dealing with the dilemma and after then declaring the doctrine. He says, Peter, here's the defense. Verse 17. If seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves among the sinners like the Judaizers are saying, Peter, does that mean Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. Peter, verse 18, if I rebuild what I destroyed, if all of a sudden I go back under the yoke of the law, Pharisee of Pharisee, trying to earn my righteousness through following the law, guess what, Peter? I am the lawbreaker. By the way, Peter, verses 19 and 20, through the law, I died to the law. I, it's no longer my master. It no longer fools me into thinking that I could try to earn my salvation by following the namas. I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have a new master, a new husband. My old husband died. Guess what? I'm now the bride of Christ. How did that happen, Peter? You know. I've been crucified with Christ. I died with Christ. I rose with Christ. It is no longer I that live, Peter. It is Christ through his spirit that lives in me. And Peter, the life I now live. I live in the body, but I live by faith in the Son of God. And I do it out of gratitude because he loved me and gave himself for me. And then he goes on to say, verse 21, I do not set aside the what of God? The grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Peter, you ready to wake up now? Does Christ promote sin? We're the sinners if we go back the other way, Peter. Peter, we died to the law. We were crucified with Christ. We now live with Christ to honor Christ. We follow the law now, not to earn our salvation, but out of gratitude for the gift of salvation, Peter. And oh, by the way, Peter, you follow your buddies, the Judaizers, let me tell you something, Peter. I'm living for Christ. You go back and follow your buddy, the Judaizers. I will never nullify the grace of Christ. Chapter five. Peter, Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by What? Yoke of slavery. It's like a prisoner being set free after 30 years in jail. He's free. And you know what he does the next day? He goes walking back into the jail. Makes no sense. Paul says it makes no sense to go back to the law. We're under grace. He says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised or try to do anything to earn your salvation according to what the Judaizers say, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law, you have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You saw Paul's dilemma, you saw Paul's doctrine, and you saw Paul's defense. What's Peter going to do? You know what Peter ended up doing? He woke up. And the great apostle Peter got back in line. Christian, let me tell you something right now. You know a lot of Peters right now. You know a lot of people who have heard the word of God from us, the true word of God. 
They understand salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But what's happened is there's Judaizers out there pulling at them. That's a dilemma you're going to have to deal with. You have the right doctrine, don't you? And you've got the right defense. Because let me tell you something. If they're saying that you're wrong and you got the word from Christ, then they're saying Christ is a sinner. You need to explain to these people they die to the law. They die to following all these religious traditions to try to earn their salvation. You've got to rescue them from the yoke of slavery that leads to death. And you've got to have courage just like Paul had. You can't let these people fall into that trap because it's a highway to hell. Let me show you what I mean. We'll close here. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning, meaning saying no to grace and yes to the law, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, well, there's no sacrifice for sins left because there's only one sacrifice, that's Christ. But there's only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses, that's Old Testament for Moses, they died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as unholy thing, as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? That's why Paul said, I will never nullify the grace of Christ. For we know him, God, who said, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Are you going to let those Peters that you know in your life fall into the hands of God? Because you don't have enough courage to stand up and tell them, no, it's not that I'm wrong or that Christ is wrong. You're sinning. You're wrong on this one. They are nullifying the grace of Christ. And let me tell you something. God is a merciful God. He's allowed them to hear the grace of, about the grace of Christ. He's allowed them to read of word, the word of Christ. He's allowed them to communicate, commune with the fellowship of, of the people of Christ. But there comes a time when people keep saying no and no and going back to their old and rebuilding that old way. And God finally says, enough's enough. Are you your brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You died to the law. You were crucified with Christ. You now live for Christ. You never nullify the grace of Christ. And you don't let others nullify the grace of Christ. There's plenty of cowards out there. There's very few people who have courage. May we be the people, the people of God who stand firm on the word of God and never nullify the grace of God. And we have courage to bring glory and honor to God. Amen? Let's pray. God, we adore you for your grace. We believe that we are justified, declared not guilty in your sight, declared righteous in your sight only because of the grace of Christ. We once all built our own system, false system of a work salvation. Lord, that has come crashing down and we vow to never try to rebuild that again. 
We've died to the law. We've been crucified with Christ and we now live for Christ, for the glory of Christ and we will never nullify the grace of Christ. Yet as I say that, there are so many people we know, Lord, who are doing that. Give us the courage we pray like Paul had to deal with the dilemma, to present clear and correct doctrine and to stand courageously when it comes to the defense. There are so many people being deceived and misled by the devil, Lord, that they think they can add to the finished work of Christ. And we know many of those people. Lord, have mercy on them. Lord, grant us the strength to talk to them about your mercy and grace. And Lord, would you please, please bring glory to your name. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you that we have been crucified with you, that we died with you, that we have risen with you, that we have life with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.